church good morning. it is good to be church this day yes. welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent welcome to everybody who's joining us on Facebook live this morning it is a day of celebration this day today we'll be celebrating the baptism of Amir Watts um, and we'll be celebrating together as a community Amen. and that is a good thing in this day and age, when too many things in the world trying to pull us apart, anything that knits us together, Amen. that is a gift from God, and we are grateful to everything that God does for us. And especially in this season of Advent, it is a time of watching and waiting and preparation, a time of expectation. And I think that's one of those things that we don't often think about when it comes to the season of Advent is expectation. When you're expecting something, it's going to happen, yeah. right? It's going to happen. Yeah. And I remember very distinctly um, many, many, well, not many years ago. How old is Gregory now? <laughs> he turns 27 Ooh. in January. When did that happen? Wow. But um, during that Advent, Denise was great with child. 
think of it, right? He was born early January. She was a embodiment of being <laughs> expectant. Yeah. Um, and it's an interesting thing because you know that something's going to happen. Yeah. That's what Advent is. We await those times when we know something's going to happen. Yeah. And that something is the way in which Christ is stirring even now yeah. in our midst. And so welcome. Welcome to worship on this second Sunday of Advent. And what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Mari to join me over by the wreath. You'll need a light. <laughs> And as she gets that, we begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The day is surely coming when the wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the brer graze together. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like an ox. On that day, the peace of God will. Pastor can turn his page. We will know exactly what God will do. Honestly. The reign of God will be established forever. And so this day we pray. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe. We give you thanks for the circle of light that marks our days of preparation for Christ's advent. Kindle within us the fire of your spirit that we may be filled with the place that overcomes doubt and fear. We say together, blessed be God forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning, choir. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Roland. It is good to see you all. Good morning, Genesis.
Amen. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from you. Bless those who will read to us the scriptures. Make us hunger for the word of life. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. As I was, um, as we're all just trying to prepare for uh, and get ready for the coming of our Lord and Savior, there was a song that just kept ringing in my ear all week. And so I just want to sing just a, a little bit of it with you, just a few words. And um, it's uh, Jesus. Jesus, I love calling your name. Jesus, I love calling your name. Jesus, I love calling your name above all names. Jesus, I love calling your name. Jesus, I love calling your name. Jesus, I love calling your name above all names. Wonderful counselor, prince of peace. King of King, you're the name above all names. Jesus, I love calling your name. Sometimes all we need to do is say Jesus. Sometimes all we need to do is say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. The first lesson is Isaiah chapter 11. Verses 1 through 10. Amen. 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 A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lay down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hands on the adder's den. <laughs> they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Ooh, 
here ends the reading of the Lord's word. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. The Lord is good. All the time. Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7, and then we'll go to 18 to 19. Psalm 72, verses 1 through 7, then 18 to 19, and we shall read successfully. And this is what the word says. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to a king's son. May he love the people with righteousness and the poor with justice. May the mountain yield prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he be at the call of the poor of the people to the Mm, I done lost a place. <laughs> Thank you. May he live with the sun endurance. And as long as the moon throughout all generation. May he be like rain that falls on the grass. Like showers that pour on the earth. In his day, may righteousness flourish and peace around until the moon is no more. We'll go to 18. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the whole earth. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. May the Lord have a blessing. To his word. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. The second lesson is taken from Romans chapter 15, verse, verses 4 through 13. Amen. That's Romans 15, verses 4 through 13. Amen. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm that the promise is given to the patriarchs in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of, Je the root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. For in him the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Here ends the second lesson. Amen.
gospel according to St. Matthew, the third chapter, verses 1 through 12. Matthew writes, Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry about that. This has just been one of those days. That's a little bit later in the story. Honestly. Everybody's writing this down, going, see? Pastor made a poop. Let's try this one again. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Matthew writes, In those days John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John wore clothing of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thank you. 
This is one of the things that I love about our choir and the music ministry of our congregation is that when we get thrown a little bit of a curveball, as you notice, Mr. Billy wasn't in church today, wasn't feeling well today, and so we kind of like, can we do this? And we're like, I don't worry about these folks. I mean, they're just, you know, honestly. You know, the most professional group of, you know, they just, they just run with it. And so thank you, thank you. What a wonderful, this is a gift. Our choir, our music ministry, it is a gift, and they just roll with things, and that is an awesome thing. John the Baptist makes us nervous. I just want to get that out there. John the Baptist makes us nervous, right? But I want you to look at the front cover of your bulletin. There's a picture. See that lovely statue? And you're thinking, I don't want that guy anywhere near me. <laughs> that is a statue of John the Baptist. He looks handsome, doesn't he? <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Right? Kind of gaunt. His robes look, well, like they've been around. That look on his face. That's the scowl that you don't want to see. And I remember early on in our married life together, and Denise was in her first congregation. We were out in rural North Dakota. And she came up to me after church one day. She goes, why do you scowl when I preach? And I'm like, I'm concentrating. She goes, could you concentrate with a smile on your face. We don't like to see that kind of scowl. That makes us uncomfortable. You look at somebody and they're like, you know, and you're like, oh, you just want to crawl right into your own skin. This statue of John the Baptist is in Florence, Italy. And you're thinking, that's a long way away from here. And yeah, it is. But I spent a few summers there teaching. And so I grew to love this statue. It's one of my favorites. And you're thinking, well, pastor, that explains a lot. <laughs> right? The whole, you've got all of Florence, right? You've got all this Renaissance art, and you pick this modern depiction of John the Baptist scowling at everybody. It explains so much. But I love it not only because of how it depicts John the Baptist, but where it stands. Because look at that picture again. Right? Just keep that in the back of your mind. I think both the depiction and the location make us even more nervous. Right? It's not like John the Baptist doesn't give us a little bit of edginess anyway. Right? But notice that this statue is not tucked safely away in a museum. It's right out there on the city streets, right in the middle of a really busy intersection, smack in the middle of both a market area for locals and a tourist hub, right? There are literally thousands of people that walk past this statue every day. And I love, love the symbolism of this. Because far too often we like John the Baptist when he is safely a long way away from us. Especially safely removed in both time and distance. It's like, oh, how nice. I don't have to look at you for another year. We like John the Baptist safely buried 2,000 years ago and so far out into the Palestinian wilderness that we as folks who live in the metro Detroit area can't even really wrap our brains around what kind of terrain we're talking about. Right? They always describe him. He's out in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. He sounds like one of those people who has a YouTube cooking show where he goes off and eats strange things. 
But we like John the Baptist as far away from us as possible. We admire him from a distance, a very safe distance. Because when John the Baptist starts getting rolling with his calls for repentance, right? We're like, oh, we definitely don't want him here, right? Because, well, wait, so, but we do like the fact that he starts busting on the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh, now we like John the Baptist because we can sit back and say, yeah, John, you tell him. We like it when John the Baptist is pointing at somebody else. Those folks, whoever they may be, need to get their acts together. Right, John, you're, you, you and me, we're in this together. Those people have some work to do. But more normally, we like old locust breath at a safe distance. <laughs> Not just because of the locust breath, but because of what he says. Because when he's at that safe distance, we can helpfully point out how everyone else needs to turn around. Or, and I think we do this even more often, when John the Baptist is far away from us, when we can essentially pretend that he never existed, if we don't listen to a story but maybe once a year, we can turn all of his calls for repentance into something very vague very general, and therefore inconsequential. If somebody just vaguely says, it's time for you to repent, we're like, oh, yeah, I'll get right around to that. That's right there, right next to my New Year's resolution. I'm on it. Right? But when he isn't so removed even in something as innocuous as a statue, we have to start thinking about John the Baptist. We have to start thinking about what he was calling us to do. We have to start thinking about the undeniable fact that he wasn't actually sparing anybody from his withering critique. Yes, yes, he was going after the Pharisees and the Sadducees, but don't put yourself out of that list. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all got some repentance to do in the big and in the little, in the general and in the specific. In the societal, we've got lots to repent for. But let's not so focus on society that we forget that person looking at us in the mirror in the morning. John, standing right in our midst, well, that starts to make him harder to ignore. It takes a lot of work to pretend that he isn't calling us out. And what really gets under our skin is the realization that he's calling me out. I think this is why the people who put together the lectionary never give us a break. You'll notice every second Sunday of Advent, every second Sunday of Advent, right? You can't get away from it. Every second, second Sunday of Advent, there's John the Baptist rolling out of the wilderness all up in our face and stepping on our toes, raining on our holiday parties and reminding us that all your festivities actually have a cost, Right? This is why the people who don't use the lectionary, shockingly enough, they never preach on John the Baptist. They avoid him altogether. Oh, what? I don't know what happened to this schedule. All of a sudden, John the Baptist just slid right off. Because you see, we need to be called out every now and then. Right? I know we don't like it. And everybody's like, really, Pastor, you can skip this part, right? You know what I mean? It's, it's really not necessary to remind us of the fact that we don't like to be called out. I, right? Okay, it could just be me. Everybody else here today, you're like, oh, pastor, wow, you've got issues. What are you hiding? But we need to be held to account. Part and parcel of the problem that we have in the world today is that we don't hold people to account. 
We let their bigotry or their hatred just run rampant and they never get held to account. And we do that on the social level, but we also do it in our individual lives. There are times when we need to be held responsible for what we have done and for what we have left undone. And I know it's uncomfortable, but it's the only way to grow. We don't get better in this lifetime if we don't turn around from doing the things that we know are wrong. We know what's right and wrong. That's the other thing. It's always like, oh, I didn't know. Yes, you did. No, you you don't get to say, I never knew. Really? What planet do you actually live on? We know what's right and wrong. Every time you're about to do something wrong and you get that thing in the pit of your stomach, that's a big red sign saying, maybe you shouldn't do that. If you think to yourself, you know, maybe I'm crossing a line I shouldn't cross. Listen to yourself. Right? We know when we have done something that we're not supposed to do. We know when we're right on the edge of it, right? We're just looking over the cliff. That's a mighty long fall. But I'm okay. I'll jump anyway. What could go wrong? And John reminds us of this which is why we like to keep him out of the way. But John also reminds us that there's a different way, a better way. You don't have to jump. You don't have to go into that same pit that you've been falling in for years. It's not something you have to do. There's a way out of the wilderness. There is a way out of this fail rinse, repeat cycle that we sometimes get ourselves into. There's a way out, and there is one who will lead you home. There is one who will baptize with fire to purify, to burn off the crust that we allow to accumulate over ourselves, covering up who we are, who we are meant to be, Because here's the thing, every single person in this room, everybody in the world, you were created good. Whatever you are, however you were made is how God made you, and God doesn't make junk. God made you good. I remember saying or hearing something about that in the book of Genesis. What God created is good. We know that. That's how God made you. And God wants you to get back to that. God wants you to get back to how he made you. You see, sin is an accretion of the way the world always works. It's a crust that we allow to form on ourselves with its focus on power or control or living solely by uh, by economy. If you do that, then I'll do this. This sin accumulates on us the violence, the bitterness, the hatred, the cruelty, the bigotry, the way in which we lead our lives with condemnation, or apathy and ignorance. It crusts over the beauty of God's creation. You. You. And here's the thing. God wants nothing more than to remind you of who you were created to be. Beloved. Precious. Beautiful. Unique. You are as God made you. And God wants you to get back there. So John the Baptist is sent by God to stir us up, to wake us up, 
because we can sleepwalk our way through our whole lives. We're going to take back woke. That belongs to this community. And it is a compliment. It is a call to action, right? Stay woke is a good thing because it means your eyes are finally open to who you were called to be, who you were created to be. And shockingly enough, that means that we are supposed to lead with compassion and acceptance and understanding. We get that word back. And so John the Baptist wakes us up. And if it's going to take a little bit of yelling and a little bit of stalking out of the wilderness to do that, if he has to do it with the subtlety of a brick, so much let's go there. And this leads me to the second aspect of the statue that I love so much. Look back to it. The statue ain't static, is it? I mean, yes, it's a statue, and so it's not moving, but look at it. His feet up are off the ground right? That cloak is flowing out behind him. The hands are raised. It depicts, even though it's made in bronze, it depicts movement. It depicts forward progress. John is on the tips of his toes, hand outstretched, moving forward, calling us to move with him. To shake off the sin that binds us, that crusts over us and slows us to a crawl, that threatens to stop us dead in our tracks because that's what sin does. It stops us. It keeps us immobile. It freezes us into place. It lulls us to sleep. It sings narcotic lullabies until we are passive and gone. And John calls us out of this torpor, this inaction, this apathy, this cultivating of a calcified status quo. This is why he singles out the Pharisees and the Sadducees specifically. You know why? He's a Pharisee. Jesus is a Pharisee. He's calling out his own folks. And he knows that the Pharisees and the Sadducees should know better. They know better. But they're so wrapped up in their institutionalism that they've stopped caring about people and care only for maintaining status and power. Right? When our leaders get to the point where they're more concerned about their jobs than serving the people, they've lost the plot. And that's in the church and that's outside of the church. That's one of those things that we've just got to recognize that Jesus is calling them out because they should know better. And that the only way that power is good is when it does good for all the people. Period. That's the way it's supposed to work. If you've got advantages in your life, if you've got privileges in your life, if you've got power and status, that's supposed to be used to do good. That's why you've got it. Those are the gifts that God's given to you. So use them the way God intended you to use them. Power is not just to accumulate to yourself. It's to let it go so that it can do the good it was intended to do for all people. And so, yeah, John calls us to account. And then he pours water over our head, and the crust begins to melt away. And we begin to move once more, flexing muscles long since atrophy. And we start to remember that as God's good creation, we have the ability to move forward. And we can let the words of repentance spill out of our mouths. We can say, I'm sorry. I did wrong. And by letting that go, more of the crust falls from us. And all of a sudden we can feel that stirring in our hearts by the Holy Spirit bringing us back to life through the grace of God. 
All of a sudden, we know that our bodies can do what they've been called to do. Our brains can do what they've been called to do. And our heart can do what it's been called to do. John's hand is outstretched because he's pointing to the one who will come after him. The one for whom we watch and wait in this Advent season. Because Jesus is going to do the thing that we need most. Jesus knows that we're never going to get there on our own. Jesus knows that we can't break our shackles on our own. We're too bound. And so Jesus comes as the incarnate one to shatter the crust of sin that holds us fast. He liberates us. He purifies us, burning off all that keeps us still and solid and unmoving. And then he says, but you're free, but free to go build the future that God wants us to build. And all of a sudden, that ludicrous vision from Isaiah starts to ring in our heads because that's what God wants us to build. God wants us to go in that direction, and I get it. I get it. You read that stuff from Isaiah, and you're like, oh, Isaiah, you need more sleep. Because that's a deliriously loopy vision, isn't it? Wolf and lamb, leopard and kid, calves and lions, cows and bears. It feels like a bad movie script. (laughs) Kids, little ones playing over snake pits. That sounds like a great idea. (laughs) And a little child shall lead them. And now we're like, well, you know, maybe, you know, maybe the cow and the bear, but kids, come on. We shake our heads at the impossibility of it, the foolishness of it all. But that's just the thing. What is foolishness to us? It wisdom to God. What is impossible for us is possible with God. And so God puts that ideal out there so that we know what we're aiming for. As Proverbs says, without a vision, the people perish. And so God cooks up the most amazing vision and sets it right before us. And we say to ourselves, but how? And John the Baptist and Christ himself say, you take the first step. Because our sin has so frozen us into place, we don't even know how to move. And the water of baptism and the stirring of the Spirit get us moving getting us moving so that we can take steps towards that vision, so that we can take concrete, real steps towards greater equity in our economy, (coughs) greater equity in our health care, right? It's 2022. There's no reason in the world that we should have such horrifying black maternal mortality rates. Why is that a thing? We can take steps to make that better. We can take steps towards greater equity in our system of justice, in our political system. There's no reason, if you've been watching the news, for the people in Georgia to be standing in lines for however many hours. That's done on purpose. That's done to suppress the vote. There's no reason that we should have that in 2022. We can take steps towards ending the epidemic of gun violence. There is absolutely no reason in the world that our school children should have to do active shooter drills. What are we putting up with? 
We can take the steps. We can no longer have the luxury of being frozen in place. I don't know. Somebody might get upset. Upset them. <laughs> Jesus turned over tables when the need fit. We can take steps to unending hunger today. There is no reason that we cannot end it right now. It's not a production problem. It's a political problem. The only reason that food doesn't get to people is because their leaders don't want it to. Amen. We can make a difference, but it's going to take all of us to move. It's not good for just one person that can't do it alone. We've got to have power in numbers, and that means all of us have got to get up. All of us have got to wake up and do the things that God is calling us to. We, we can take steps so that there is a day when everybody is welcome and they know it, accepted and they know it, no matter the color of your skin, no matter the language that you speak, no matter who you love. Everybody is welcomed. Everybody is accepted. How is it that we haven't gotten there? How is it that we seem to take some steps backwards? Well, I hate to say it. It's people who look like me. And that ain't right. It is our responsibility to do what we know needs to be done so that all of the beloved community walks together. Because we are all God's creation, every single one of us. That is who we are because that is whose we are. There is nobody outside of God's love, nobody. And so like Isaiah, Martin Luther King's dream is the vision we need in front of us right now, maybe more than ever. Because when vicious and violent bigotry and hatred is sludging and surging through both our body politic and those who claim to be the body of Christ, we've got work to do. And so, there's John the Baptist stepping right into our lives when we need to hear from him most to shake us up, to wake us up, to call us into lives of repentance and to bear fruit, to do the things that God has called us to do, to be the ones that God has called us to be. Isaiah then gives us the vision to work toward. And Jesus, Jesus the Christ comes to us, liberates us from our sin washes us clean in our baptisms as we are going to witness in just a few moments as Amir is baptized and made a member of the family of God. Jesus forgives our sins, washes us clean, purifies our lives, and shows us the way forward that there is a path that we can all walk for the betterment of everybody right here, right now. And then Jesus does the thing that we need most because as we gather around this table and as we take the bread and the wine, the body and blood, Christ promises to strengthen us for the journey. We're not doing this on our own. God's not saying, I want you to do this, now go do it, and I'm going to sit back in my chair and see how it unfolds. Right? God's not sitting back in his recliner opening a beer and a bag of chips and going, I wonder how this is going to turn out. <laughs> huh. Hmm. God is with us. That's what Emmanuel means. God with us. That is the one for whom we wait in this Advent season. So John's call to repentance, I hope it's happening right now. I hope that call to repentance, that call to action is ringing in your ears and resonating in your heart and in your soul because it's time to heed the call. 
It's time to step into God's good future. In Genesis, it starts right here, right now. Amen. Good morning, Genesis. Good morning. Usually we do the announcements right here. We got more important work to do. Amen. And so I'm going to ask the family to come up around the baptismal font. And we are going to celebrate the sacrament of holy baptism. Amen. You can step right around. Good morning, Amir. <laughs> you, you can hold them. Hold them to yourself for now, because it's going to be a moment or two before we get to that moment. <laughs> He's... All right. Amen. Hear the testimony of the Holy Scriptures concerning baptism. And I'm going to encourage everybody, there's a um, bulletin insert. There are times for the congregation to respond. Respond with boldness is your call today. Um, and so, and I'll point things out as we go along. So here are the testimony of the Holy Scriptures concerning baptism. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away. The Ethiopian said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The Ethiopian saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. We join together. We obey our Lord's command and trust in his promise as we baptize in his name. Who are the parents and sponsors? Who are, who is going to um, present a mirror for baptism? Okay, you're going to need the this. What I want you to do is read right here. Before the God of our ancestors, and on behalf of this congregation, we present a mirror to receive the sacrament and the holy baptism. Amen. Amen. In holy baptism, God graciously delivers us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Through water and the word, the Holy Spirit calls us to walk a new life in God. In this new life, we are joined across time and space to our ancestors who have lived and died trustingly and to the whole Christian community on earth. Their witness supports our Christian journey. Nourished by the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and the prayers, our brother will be empowered to live in the fullness of his baptism and to join all of God's reborn people in serving the community with his gifts. By presenting a mirror for holy baptism, you commit yourselves to providing for his growth in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. As Apollos was instructed in the way of the Lord, you join this community's teachers and elders in handing over the holy scriptures the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. Do you intend to act in this way for your child and for the sake of Jesus? If so, answer, we do. We do. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, O God, maker and ruler of all things. Your voice thundered over the waters at creation. The wa you water the mountains and send springs into the valleys to refresh and satisfy us and all living things. Through the waters of the flood, you carry those in the ark to safety. Through the sea, you have led your people Israel from slavery to freedom. In the wilderness, you nourished them with water from the rock, and you brought them across the river Jordan to the promised land. By the baptism of his death and resurrection, your son Jesus has carried us to safety and freedom. The floods shall not overwhelm us. The deep shall not swallow us up. For Christ has brought us over to the land of promise. He sends us to make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Wash away sin in this cleansing water. Clothe the baptized with Christ and claim your daughters and sons, no longer Jew or Greek, no longer slave or free, no longer male or female, but one with all the baptized in Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. To the whole gathered community, I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, I renounce. Do you renounce the devil? I renounce the devil. Do you renounce all the devil's empty promises? I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Okay, now, however it's most comfortable. <laughs> Amir, Amir, look at me. We talked about this last week. And so this is what we're going to do. Amir, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. He did a great job. Yeah, he better be like Please bring him close. Come here, Amir. Come here. Come to me, okay? All right. We've got a few more things to do, okay? So first, I'm going to lay my hand on your head, all right? Or just up here. Is that all right? Let's do this. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your Son from the power of sin and for raising him up to new life through the Holy Sacrament. Pour your Holy Spirit upon Amir, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Amen. Amen. And Amir, receive the sign of the Holy Cross on your forehead, sealed by Christ's love forever. And lastly, I'm going to ask you to light the candle. The body. Yeah. I'm going to hold this for you. And we say, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works in glory to God. Amen. Amen. Will you please hold that? Thank you. Let us pray. O oh God, the giver of all life, look with kindness upon the parents of this little one. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you have given them. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness for their children. 
Strengthen them in their own baptism so that they may share eternally with their children the salvation you have given them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Through baptism, God has added your name to the role of all our ancestors in faith. You are a part of the priesthood we share in Christ Jesus, and you have not been called in vain. Therefore, take up your cross and follow Jesus to the prairies and grasslands in the desert wilderness, along the freeways and back alleys of suburb and city. You belong now to God, sent to witness for Christ before all the world. And we join together. We welcome you into the Lord's family. We receive you with great joy to live with us in the body of Christ, to share with us in God's new creation, to work with us by the power of the Spirit. Amen. Genesis, come here, Amir. I have our newest brother to present to our congregation. <laughs> God's blessing to you, Amir. And God's blessing to you, family. Thank you so much. And I'm going to invite anybody who would like to come up to remember their baptisms. Come to the font. Dip your hands in. Make the sign of the cross in remembrance of your own baptism. Amen. And let us join in this day of celebration. Amen. And you can do this at any time during the announcements. Amen. Good morning, church. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will continue to rejoice. Amen. Amen. We've got a couple of announcements um, this morning. Um, first off, I would like to greet um, Pastor Ben Adams and all the folks from All Together Ministries. If you don't feel so Self-conscious, would you stand so that we can greet you and say welcome to Genesis Lutheran Church. Glad that you're here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, All Together Ministries is a vital new ministry in the Synod. It's a joint ministry of the Lutheran Church and the Episcopal Church. They do campus ministry at Wayne State, um, University of Michigan, Dearborn, and Henry Ford College. Um, this is a ministry that we want to support and to celebrate, and so we are glad to be with you during this season of Advent, and thank you for coming today. A um, couple of other announcements. Don't forget that we are full in the throes of the Adopt-A-Family program. Um, if you have food to bring in, um, during this time, I'm, I'm here Monday through Thursday, 9.30-ish to 2.30-ish. So if you can drop off during the day, please do that. But also know 
Um, choir's here on Tuesday nights. The quilters are here on Saturday mornings. Um, there's usually somebody here at those times um, to, for you to drop off. Um, we're building 130 baskets this year, um, and we are raising funds to buy presents for 100 and 102 kids um, in two of our local schools. This is a big project. <laughs> Um, this is one of those many hands make light work moments, um, and we need everybody to, to um, support that. So um, if you're not sure if I'm going to be here or not, text me or call me, right? Just like say, Pastor, are you actually doing your job today, or are you just sitting at home eating bonbons and watching the telenovelas? I mean, what's going on? Um, okay, that could have been me just, you know, years ago. All right, so... A um, couple of other things. Um, we are going to have a Christmas program this year. Um, Christmas, um, um, the Christmas Day falls on a Sunday this year. And so what we're going to do is um, Terry Maria and others are putting together a Christmas program um, that we will have on Christmas morning. And so I invite you to put that in your calendars. And when Terry comes to say, will you help? Your response is, yes, with the help of God. <laughs> yes, Terry. We desperately need children. So, so I'm asking really? that you tear yourselves apart, because Jesus is the reason for the season on Christmas Day, to uh, come out and be a part of this Christmas play, this Christmas ministry. Um, we're going to try to rehearse next Saturday at 12 o'clock. It's very simple. It's angels and shepherds and all that good stuff. So awesome. we just need children to participate. So if you know of a little one that's in this congregation, um, please bring them out next Tuesday, next Saturday at 12 o'clock. Next Saturday at 12 o'clock. All right. Um, and frankly, I couldn't think of a better way to start Christmas morning right? Come, enjoy the um, Christmas play. Christmas dinner can wait just another little bit. They really can. <laughs> and if you open Christmas presents like our family does on Christmas morning, those will wait too. Yes, they do. Or you get up early. It's one of the two, right? It's one of those things. And everybody's like, oh, they'll wait then. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Terry. And yes, and little ones in the congregation, but also friends and family of the congregation, okay? So, um, speaking of friends and family, um, we have two birthdays this week. Um, Gloria White celebrates her birthday on December 5th, and Rosa Henderson celebrates her birthday December 9th. So, happy birthday, Rosa. Um, Oh, that's right. And Amir's birthday is tomorrow. So, baptism birthday? Birthday. Makes it very easy, right? All right. Um, last thing, um, and that is yesterday um, we celebrated the home going for Leon Darnell. Um, and it was, it was good to be with family. Um, and to um, support the family. So please, please keep them in your prayers in what is always a difficult time. All right? Are there any other announcements? Did I miss anything? Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything. All right? Okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience during all of our announcements. Again, um, this is one of those things that um, an active church means lots of announcements. Last announcement for this Sunday, though, is this. Um, offering plates are at the doors um, to, for the sanctuary. So if you would like to support the ministries of Genesis Lutheran Church, the offering plates are in the back. All right. Thank you. Um, at this time, what we'll do is we'll take a moment to ready ourselves to receive the sacrament, and we'll continue on then with the um, prayers of the church.
Please stand. God of peace, your message calls us to let go of our fears and place our trust in you. Sustain us in your peace as we await your coming. God of the covenant, we give you thanks for your church in the world. Guide us to live out the covenant you established with us at baptism so that all people may know your salvation. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of light, we give you thanks for your everlasting reign where the wolf and lamb shall live together and the cow and bear shall graze without concern. Direct world leaders and international organizations so that your peace will find its way into desolate lands and defeated hearts. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of compassion, we give you thanks for your tender mercy. Comfort all who suffer, the sick, the imprisoned, and the dying. We pray especially this day for those we name silently or aloud. May all for whom we pray be restored to wholeness. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of welcome, we give you thanks for ushers, greeters, and all who provide a ministry of hospitality. Encourage us all to serve with openness and inclusion so that Christ's welcome is made known to all. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of relationship, we give you thanks for our partners in ministry, Genesis Hope, Acts in Common, 
all together ministries. Move us to work together so that our collective efforts reach all who are in need. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of hope, we thank you for the salvation you have prepared for your people. Grant us faith as we await the fulfillment of your promised peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we remain awake and ready for your return, O Lord, may your word and sacrament fortify us that we might bear witness to your coming among us. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, mighty Lord, Prince of Peace, we give you thanks that on the first day of all creation you dispelled the raging chaos, bring forth order and peace and making way for the coming of your kingdom. We give you thanks for the prophets who proclaim the coming of the one who will usher in a new day, a day filled with trust and hope for the fulfillment of all of God's promises. We give you thanks for Jesus, the righteous branch of David, the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and glory, the one for whom we watch and wait with eager expectation in this Advent season. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that nourished by your presence, we may be made all the more aware of the coming of your kingdom. We praise you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us join together to pray the prayer that Christ himself has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Behold the Lord whose advent we await, who will come in glory to, on the day of judgment. Blessed are those who are called to this holy meal. Amen. Come, for the table is set, and all are welcome. <laughs>
This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the body of Christ given for you.
Let us join together with the post-communion prayer. Faithful God, in this meal you have remembered your mercy, bringing heaven to earth in the body and blood of Christ. As we wait for the day when all your promises are fulfilled, sustain us and strengthen us by this holy mystery. Guide us toward your promised future, coming to birth in Jesus Christ our Lord. God, the eternal word, who dwells with us in Jesus and who holds us in the grace of the Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.